In the mid-9th century, the king of Lotharingia, Lothar II, was married to a noblewoman named Tutberga. But when their marriage produced no children, Lothair wanted to divorce his wife so that he could marry his mistress, Wallafrid. Now, serial monogamy, that is, repeatedly divorcing one wife to marry another, was not at all uncommon in the early Middle Ages. But in this case, things went differently. Tutberga's brother, Hookbert, and the church opposed the divorce, and it started a long and arduous divorce trial, which was unprecedented at the time. As part of the arguments in support of the divorce, Lothar's camp accused Tutberga of committing incest with her brother, which caused God to curse her with infertility. Now, since this was a secret crime, she couldn't exactly call on witnesses to defend her side. So instead, she called upon God. She offered to undergo a special kind of trial. Or in this case, because she was a noblewoman, she had a champion do it on her behalf. After three days of fasting and prayer, a cauldron of water was set to boil on an open fire, and in it was dropped a small object, which might have been a ring or maybe a little stone. Priests celebrated Mass and blessed the object, requesting that through it, God should show the truth of the matter. The Queen's champion then plunged their arm into the boiling hot water to retrieve the object and pull it out, after which their arm was immediately bandaged. After three more days, the bandage was finally removed, in the presence of one witness from each camp, as well as the priest who was overlooking the whole trial. If the arm had been excessively burnt or was putrefying, this would have been seen as a sign by God of Tutberga's guilt. But that's not what happened. Instead, it was determined that the arm was healing properly, which was seen as a sign that God had protected the queen's champion in order to reveal her innocence. This was a trial by ordeal. The trial by ordeal was a type of trial which sought to determine someone's innocence or guilt with the help of God. In fact, the Latin term used for ordeal was judicium dei, which literally means judgment of God. In a worldview where it was accepted that God was all-knowing and the most just, and which regularly depicted God as standing as judge, calling upon divine judgment in difficult cases made a lot of sense. And in a worldview where God was able to alter nature and make unusual things happen in the form of miracles, and where priests regularly invoked such miracles during Mass in the form of the Eucharist, where bread and wine were transformed into the body and blood of Christ, the use of such miracles in determining God's judgment in these cases also made a lot of sense. Tutberga's ordeal was a specific type called the trial by hot water, or trial by cauldron, and this was just one of several types that existed. It was the oldest of the non-combat trials, and was probably originally a Frankish development. It's mentioned in the first recension of the Salic Laws from around 510, and it only shows up in the laws of other peoples as Frankish power and influence spreads. The early date also means that it likely has some origin in pre-Christian tradition, but we really know nothing about any similarities or differences or, or really anything about the ordeal before 510. New types of ordeals begin to show up with the Carolingian usurpation of the Frankish throne in the mid-8th century, and they really develop in the 9th under Charlemagne and his successors. One new type which developed was the trial by the cross. Here, both parties faced each other, standing with their arms stretched out in the shape of a cross, until one side dropped their arms out of exhaustion. This type of trial was actually fairly popular for a while, but it was ultimately banned fairly early on by Louis the Pious, who saw it as disrespecting the holy symbol of the cross. Others lasted longer, however. One of the most influential would be the trial by hot iron, which was similar to hot water, except that instead of plunging one's hand into a boiling cauldron, the accused would hold on to a glowing hot iron rod and take three steps before dropping it. A variation of this was the trial by hot plowshares, which is first attested in the laws of the Thuringians, for which burning hot plowshares were placed on the ground and the accused had to walk over them. Another type was the trial by cold water, probably originating under Charlemagne with the support of the papacy. Here, the accused was thrown into a river which had been blessed and, if they sank, as would be natural, they were deemed innocent. But if they floated, it was seen as a sign of God's rejection, and therefore their guilt. Now, there's a common misconception about these trials that I've seen and 
read, especially on the internet, that the innocence of someone was determined by them drowning in the water. But this isn't true. Although there may have been people who did drown during these trials, and it would have been just as stressful and arduous as carrying a red hot iron rod in some cases, the idea was that the innocent person who sank would be pulled out of the water after. Hinkmar of Reims, who discusses trials by ordeal in his book on the divorce case of Lothair and Tutberga, notes that a rope should be tied around the accused in order to easily pull them out of the water in case they sink. Another type of ordeal mainly used in clerical courts was the ordeal of the Eucharist. Here, the accused swore an oath of innocence before taking the Eucharist, and it was believed that if they were guilty, they would either choke on it, or they would die within a year. From a modern perspective, this one might seem like the easiest to get through, but if you genuinely believed in the divine miracle of the Eucharist, you might be just as intimidated into confessing your crime or conceding your case as you would be at the prospect of plunging your hand into boiling hot water. Finally, and possibly most famously, there was the trial by combat, where both the accuser and the accused would face off in battle. This type of trial was also old, but it was a lot more widespread early on than the trial by hot water was, though it took longer to establish itself in some parts than in others. The Anglo-Saxons, for example, have no mention of trial by combat until after the Norman invasion of 1066. In a trial by combat, it was the dissenting parties themselves who fought, though they were sometimes allowed to nominate a champion to fight on their behalf, especially if they were very young, very old, they were sick, or if they were a woman. And in fact, the Thuringian law which mentions the trial by plowshares specifies that it should be used if a woman cannot find a champion for trial by combat. Also, the use of champions became more and more common over time, to the point where some people even made a living off of being professional combat champions. Traditionally, the ordeal was fought with only clubs and shields, and many laws forbade any other gear being used for centuries. But later on, knights especially began fighting each other in full combat dress, and even beginning the duel on horseback. In theory, the battle was only until one party gave up, but when the trial was over an accusation of treason or high-value theft, which would have resulted in the guilty's execution, they could get extremely brutal and deadly. Now, not every duel was a judicium dei, uh, an ordeal. Sometimes opponents settled their disputes by combat as a simple challenge of manhood, where the best man won regardless of who was right or wrong. In societies of warrior aristocrats, where one's martial ability was a strong part of one's identity, determining things through combat was not uncommon. But the actual ordeal duel was different. Here, it was expected that God would assist the warrior representing the right side to win, regardless of ability, though most people still tried to get the best possible warrior to fight for them. The miracle involved was not as obvious, but God was still letting his judgment be known. The explosion of new types of ordeal around the year 800 is connected to the fact that they started to be used more often. They were used before then, but the Carolingians placed a much bigger emphasis on them, which began what the historian Robert Bartlett calls the Age of the Ordeal, which lasted until 1215. Bartlett suggests that the promotion and growth of the ordeal was connected to the fact that the Carolingians, and especially Charlemagne, saw themselves as holding a divinely supported kingship. God had allowed them to take the Frankish throne from their Merovingian predecessors. God had, through his representative the Pope, appointed Charlemagne as Emperor of the Romans, Defender of the Faithful, Ruler of the Christians. For that divine state to function properly, laws needed to be upheld, and God would assist in that matter as well. But beyond that, the Carolingians placed heavy importance on legalism more generally, and the ordeal solved the problem in trials where ambiguity could prevent the administration of justice. In the words of Robert Bartlett, the ordeal was a device for dealing with situations in which certain knowledge was impossible, but uncertainty was intolerable. And the concern with certainty here is key, because ordeals weren't used in all or even most cases, even in its heyday. As I mentioned in my video about the Inquisition, Medieval justice was traditionally reliant upon witness testimony and the swearing of oaths. 
However, in cases where not enough reliable witnesses could be produced, or oaths couldn't be trusted or properly backed up, determining anything with certainty was difficult, if not impossible. This was especially a problem with secretive crimes like poisonings or covert murder, things that had to be dealt with because they were serious, but where witnesses were rarely available, and suspicion was more based on motive or circumstantial evidence. This is also why ordeals were commonly used in cases of sexual misconduct, like in Tutberga's case, because this was another activity which rarely had witnesses. Also, as I mentioned in my video about the Inquisition, ordeals began to be used in trials against heretics in the 11th century, and for the same reason, heretics practiced in secret. The more immediate results of the trial by cold water made it the more popular choice in these trials, since the sense of heretics as a public danger, who could potentially cause others to be damned through magic or simple contact, meant that they wanted to get rid of them as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, this also led to occasions of mob justice, where those accused of heresy were essentially lynched, as happened in Soissons in 1114, much to the frustration of the clerical authorities. Ordeals were also sometimes used in disputes over land and status as well, though this happened less frequently. Before charters and deeds became widespread, and even sometimes when there was one which was being disputed, two parties claiming ownership of a piece of land might call witnesses and swear oaths to support the legitimacy and antiquity of their claim. As a very last resort, however, if not enough witnesses could be brought forth or oaths couldn't be trusted, an ordeal could be held. In these cases, trial by combat was more common especially when both parties were of relatively equal status, and especially if they were both nobles. Though the party in the weaker position might choose to go through another type of ordeal if they deemed it the better option. Disputes over status were often more one-sided, and they show how ordeals could sometimes be abused. In 12th century France especially, peasants who were trying to prove that they were free and not servi, that is, serfs, were often bullied into backing down through the threat of an ordeal. For example, when a man named Otbertus burned down one of the barns of the monastery of Mamoutier and wasn't able to pay for it, he and his wife Plectrude were made the monastery's serfs. However, several years later, Plectrude claimed that her son Vitalis was not a serf since he'd been born prior to these events. The monks of Mamoutier told her to prove it by undergoing a trial by hot iron, which she initially accepted, but she ultimately backed out once the glowing rod was placed before her. It should be kept in mind here that the oath of a serf was rarely seen as reliable, and the unfree rarely got to resort to them unless their lord vouched for them, which, in cases like these, was obviously not an option. Also, when a peasant was trying to prove their own free status against the ones claiming them as a serf, they were often treated as a serf unless they could be proven otherwise, which made abuse easier. Alternatively, the Lord might produce a witness willing to prove the peasant's servile status by offering to undergo an ordeal themselves, which might convince the local count to judge in favor of the Lord without any actual ordeal taking place, especially when combat was offered and the count wanted to avoid any unnecessary death. For the most part, the concept of the ordeal itself was largely accepted throughout the age of the ordeal. It was logical and made sense in the worldview of people at the time, but that doesn't mean that specific results were never challenged. Let's turn back to the 1114 heresy case in Soissons that I mentioned earlier. The lynch mob thought that the case was clear. The accused had floated on the water, so they were a heretic, and so they had to die. Now, the clerical authorities were not too happy about this for a couple of reasons. First of all, again as I mentioned in my video about the Inquisition, the church's main goal had always been to convert heretics and not to kill them. But on top of that, the authorities hadn't yet gotten the chance to interpret the results. Although an angry mob might have been certain that the heretic floated, the reality is that when you throw someone into a flowing body of water, the result can be ambiguous. And we have several cases where ordeals were repeated multiple times before a judgment was made. Now, this could be a case of trying to obtain the expected result. These trials weren't always conducted with absolute impartiality but it's also a result of the evidence often being quite subjective. How burnt did someone's hand need to be for them to be guilty? How much did they need to sink to be innocent? Could some trick or even magic have been used to skew the results? Or maybe the priest was being bribed? 
Any of these factors could have led to somebody contesting the results. But at the same time, this wasn't all just for show. People often did respect the results of an ordeal, and these could sometimes be pretty undeniable. Likewise, the rights to conduct ordeals were granted only to certain members of the clergy, and the ordeals themselves were usually conducted away from the community involved in the hope of avoiding partial judgments. A truly neutral judge might still hold an unconscious bias, but there was often only so much room for subjective interpretation. Trial by combat was less ambiguous, but there was always a debate as to whether it was really divine intervention which led the victor to win, or whether it was just their strength and skill. The results were rarely as miraculous as the other types of ordeals, so some were quite doubtful. And the church had been pretty unanimous in condemning trial by combat from the very beginning. But nonetheless, it still carried on. Of course, there were always some who were fundamentally opposed to the ordeal for a variety of reasons. Even before Tudberga's trial and Hinkmar of Reims' defense of the results, the Bishop Agobard of Lyon had written his Liber Contra Judicium Dei, which, as the name suggests, was a book against ordeals. He criticized them for having no basis in scripture or any other authoritative tradition, and for the fact that they simplified the unknowable nature of God's judgment. He therefore compared them to divination, the epitome of pagan magic in the eyes of medieval thinkers, and he called ordeals a superstitious practice. He also wrote that such an easy means of acquiring certainty made God's promotion of reason and just judges pointless, a logical paradox in the medieval Christian mind. Nonetheless, Agabard was in the minority in the 9th century. That would change, however, by the late 12th. These same arguments were taken up again by figures like Peter Cantor, who criticized ordeals heavily. He was especially vocal about ordeals tempting God. He didn't reject the idea that God could do these things or intervene in this way, most people at the time believed in miracles, but he noted that it was truly arrogant for anyone to demand one from God whenever they wanted it. Now, defenders of the ordeal might turn to liturgy and show how the Eucharist was a regular formulaic invocation of divine blessings which brought about a miracle. In fact, part of the ordeal's legitimacy came from its closeness to the liturgy. The prayers and actions for blessing the cauldron and the iron rod were very similar to those used during Mass and Baptism, and we have several of these prayers preserved in liturgical manuscripts. But, as 12th century legalism and reform sought to define the sacraments and canon law more concretely than ever before, a rift was created. The Eucharistic miracle had biblical support, and it was esoteric. The ordeal, on the other hand, was the opposite. It was both innovative and it cheapened God's mysteries. Speaking of canon law, the increasing hostility of clerical elites towards the ordeal ultimately led to it being banned in the canons of the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, held by Pope Innocent III. This was the beginning of the end for the ordeal. Now, canon law was church law, and it didn't automatically make ordeals illegal in secular courts, which is where they were mainly happening. But the central reliance on priests for the whole process of the ordeal to work meant that this was still significant. More local church councils throughout Europe reiterated the canons of the Fourth Lateran Council, and more and more priests refused to take part in ordeals. Some highly centralized kingdoms with strong papal ties like England and Denmark banned ordeals shortly after 1215. Others took longer, but through a gradual process over the length of the 13th century, ordeals were either made illegal or simply impractical and fell out of favor pretty much everywhere. The practice lingered in some parts in highly local and exceptional cases, something the church regularly complained about, but by and large, the age of the ordeal was over. At least in the Catholic world. The ordeal was introduced into the Byzantine Empire through the Crusades, and it even made it to the Rus' principalities. And in both of these places, it lasted longer due to a denial of papal authority. In the Byzantine case, it lasted until the empire's end. but. In these places, it was never as popular as it was in the Catholic world. The other exception was for trial by combat. Because the church had always been against it, and it relied less clearly on a miracle, priests were rarely as involved in trials by combat as they were in other ordeals. This meant that they survived longer, with even critics of the ordeal like the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II retaining trial by combat in accusations of treason. Over time, though, these would also fall out of favor, and they were banned in many cases. And by the late Middle Ages, they were rather rare. 
the 2021 movie The Last Duel actually notes how unusual trial by combat was in the 1360s when the, the movie takes place. And as far as we're aware, this does actually seem to have been the last duel, at least trial by combat, in France, although there were some still in other places into the 1400s. So despite the popularity of the ordeal between 800 and 1200, the last few centuries of the Middle Ages no longer saw the ordeal as a central part of obtaining certainty. Instead, this was replaced by the inquisitorial process and torture, which was seen as a much more reliable way to obtain certainty in these similarly drastic cases. And that's actually a topic I've talked a little bit about in the Inquisition video, which I've mentioned several times throughout this one, in case you're curious. Hi, this is me on my phone a couple of days later because I forgot to film the outro. I'll keep it short and sweet and just say, uh, I hope you liked the video, I hope you learned something from it, and I'll see you guys next time.